dear friends, we welcome you at the Translation Summer School Winter Edition webinar. As you know, we'll speak about audiovisual translation, a very interesting and highly attractive topic. Uh, so today we invited an expert in teaching audiovisual translation, Professor Jorge Diaz Sintas. He's been teaching audiovisual translation for years and in, is the founder, director of the Center for Translation Studies at University of Colorado. Uh, as he is an author of numerous articles and books on audiovisual translation, uh, this is the best uh, uh, possibility for you to start learning uh, audiovisual translation ever. Uh, Professor Jorge Diaz Sintas is known to many as one of the most prominent figures in the world of subtitling. Uh, he is former president of the European Association for Studies in Screen Translation and member of Transmedia and Trauma Groups. And what is especially important, I want to highlight it, is that uh, Professor Jorge Diaz Sintas combines teaching, research, and freelance work, and tries to keep abreast for the ever-changing industry, which is a rather rare case in academia, where, as you may know, not many professors are practitioners in the world of translation. So we are sure uh, that even those of you who are uh, audiovisual translation professionals will learn something new today. Uh, please write your questions to Professor Jorge Diaz Sintas in the question and answer section at the bottom of the screen, and he'll answer them at the end of the event. And now I welcome my colleague Lesa Iwaszkiewicz to give more info about today's and tomorrow's events. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see you all this evening. And first of all, I want to thank to our partner in this event, to Michael Kleineberg and his organization, German Academic Exchange Service, uh, for the support in this webinar. Thank you a lot. Uh, and just a few words about how well we're going to work today and tomorrow. So today, uh, Jorge is going to introduce us the basics of uh, AVT yeah, and share his experience exactly with translation. And tomorrow we are going to concentrate exactly on methodology and teaching AVT. So uh, tomorrow's class will, will be more practical and will be interesting exactly for those who are going to teach uh, audiovisual translation and uh, work on um, preparing uh, own, your own courses on uh, AVT. And tomorrow in the morning we are going to send you the link to tomorrow's session. Uh, and now let's start and uh, Jorge, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Lesia, and thank you also, Alexander, uh, for the invitation to be here today with all of you. Um, I've now, I know we've known each other for a while and, and we've always meaning, we've been meaning to organize something and now we've managed to crack it. So I'm, I'm delighted to be talking to all of you. Um, as Lesia has clearly put it, uh, today I'm going to be making uh, a general introduction to the field of audiovisual translation and, uh, and tomorrow I'm going to be focusing a lot more on the didactics and, and how to explore this in the classroom. Now, um, my angle is gonna be throughout, I'm gonna be bringing in ideas on how to explore and how to do things in the classroom. I know some of you might be professionals, um, uh, students as well. Um, so I'm trying to, re to reconcile all the interests in, in the presentation. It's a little bit challenging, um, but I'll try my very best. Um, I'm gonna be exposing you as well to some software um, and I'm gonna be showing you um, how to operate in the new environments that have been recently created in the cloud. Um, and uh, you might be able as well to practice with it. Now, because the seminars are today and tomorrow, we're not going to be able to practice during the, the, the seminars, uh, but I'll make sure that you can have access to these platforms and uh, I'll give you material, also uh, guidelines that you can use uh, to uh, practice with the software. Okay, I will also make available my two PowerPoints. Today's PowerPoint will be released at the end of this session and then tomorrow's PowerPoint will also be released, released at the end of, of my class yeah, or my seminar. I'm going to share now my screen. Okay. And uh, let me see in here. Um, so this is the, the PowerPoint 
uh, that I have created now uh, for you for today. And let me see if I can um, I'll share the video panel so that I don't, it doesn't seem that I am just talking uh, to myself all the time. So I can see a couple of people here. And um, and I would like um, I'm, I'm I'm very happy for anybody to be asking questions uh, whenever you feel is necessary. Um, I'm not it's a bit challenging as you might know. Just keeping an eye on everything. Videos that I've got here, my PowerPoint, the uh, people uh, also uh, in the videos. Uh, but please, if Lesia or Alexander, if you can keep an eye on the questions coming and you feel that they are pertinent at a particular moment, don't hesitate to stop me. And sure. just tell me, Jorge, can you stop there? We've got a, a question and I will try and answer sure. that question sure. there and then. I, you know, let's try to make it as dynamic as possible yeah. in within the limits of this. Um, uh, for tomorrow, uh, today, I'm gonna be more talking and maybe at the end we can have a little bit of time, but tomorrow um, I'm planning to leave at least half an hour for questions and, and, and answers and we'll try to make it dynamic. So if there are things that I haven't touched on my paper, on my two desert, uh, presentations, feel, please feel free to ask as well uh, tomorrow. And, and I think you will be given access to uh, the platform with your videos and your mics and, and we'll try to make it a little bit more dynamic. So if today you feel that you've left out, uh, don't worry, we can catch up tomorrow. Okay, so here we go with audiovisual translation. Uh, those of you uh, who know me, and thank you, Alexander, for the introduction. Um, I am originally from Spain, so hence my accent when I speak English. And I am uh, much more of an expert on uh, subtitling than some of the other areas in audiovisual translation. So I will be slanting in my presentations to the field of subtitling, though I'm going to be touching on everything uh, that is uh, available these days in, in audiovisual translation. I've been living in the UK uh, a long, long time and, uh, and always in London and always in the south of London uh, for some particular reason. I, I, I didn't plan it to be that way, um, but I, I've always been in, in the city over 33 years now. And, and this is where I've developed my career, uh, professional, but also academic. Uh, we're still very lucky and we'll see what Brexit uh, brings down the road, but London has always been one of the main hubs for uh, audiovisual translation. And that's what has, has allowed me to be in touch with many people in the field and many companies and, and, and create good synergies uh, with all these people. Um, there's always been, uh, from my perspective, a misunderstanding, a traditional misunderstanding in the way we have considered or categorized audiovisual translation. Uh, you've got people, um, uh, you know, big names in translation, uh, Mary Snell Hornby, uh, Susan Bassnett a few years back, where they started theorizing about translation studies. Their understanding of audiovisual translation was always sort of similar to literary translation. And you can find in some of the analysis that they do and in the way that they want to tackle this area of translation as if it was literary translation. And you can fully understand why they went down that route because audiovisual translation becomes to be as a need for translating films. And films were considered to be much closer to literary artifacts, books, theater, than to technical or medical translation. So that's why audiovisual translation in the beginning, it was always the translation of films. And you've got many articles and, and, and chapters of books discussing it from that perspective. Most of the things that we've analyzed traditionally is uh, are films or TV series, but very little has been done, for instance, in the area of documentary translation corporate videos. Uh, we know now uh, that the European Union, the European Parliament rather, has just launched a unit, which is the unit for subtitling and voiceover. It's very, very new. Uh, they are creating still uh, the area and it's going to do many things. They're going to do films as well from the LAX festival, but they're going to be doing other types of films, uh, other types of audiovisual material. So audiovisual translation is not uh, uh, a genre is not the translation of films, but is a medium uh, and is, it covers two dimensions, is audio and visual. And we know now that through audio and, vi 
and visual, we can transmit anything we want, whether it is films, whether it is user generated material, whether it is uh, newspaper, uh, newspaper news, whether it is uh, uh, corporate videos, educational videos that we are doing now, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many um, media that um, uh, or many genres that have been distributed through audiovisual translation. And that has meant or that has led to this boom and explosion in the need for people to deal with audiovisual translation, but also in the different genres that we are uh, doing um, in this field. And as I said, you know, the terminology has always been a bit unstable. At the beginning, we were talking about cinema or film translation. I myself am one of those culprits. When I started in the 90s, uh, I, I called quite a few of my articles when I wrote film translation or cinema translation. Um, which were very, very reductionist. You've got as well other areas there, constraint, multimedia. Now a lot of people are talking about multimodal. Uh, we've got many dimensions and, and people are discovering this area. There are a few books now in translation, which is multimodal translation and bringing what is new uh, if, if we add multimodal, even for corpora. Uh, studies in translation, people are bringing multimodality to see how our corpora can be much more useful because right now we only base our material in written uh, text rather than in the environment, you know, by you seeing me, how I might move my hands or whether I am laughing or whether I am, my facial expressions are also communicating. And most of the material that we have for translation in general is only on the written side. Um, in or English, the one, the term that is, uh, it was popular for a while, and still some people call it that way, is screen translation. You know, remember the English people don't like long words, it's always shortenings, uh, monosyllabic expressions, and uh, it took them a while to use audiovisual translation as a term for this area. In fact, many people don't know how to write it, and then you will find audio hyphen visual, you will see it as I do it myself, audiovisual all together, and you might also see audio separated from visual. Yeah, and it's a bit sort of uh, hesitant in his uh, uh, graphical representation. Um, what is it then, audiovisual translation? What do I mean, uh, or what do we mean by audiovisual translation? Uh, we can play, take a look at this from a traditional perspective and from a more uh, contemporary perspective, though, you know, concepts like traditional and contemporary can be uh, rather misleading sometimes. From a traditional perspective and in the idea of language transfer, we are moving from one language into another. We've got an audiovisual production that needs to be translated. We've got two main ways of dealing with it. On the one hand, we've got what is known generally an umbrella term, uh, which is revoicing. And revoicing, what it means is that I'm going to be using another voice uh, in a different language. And I can do it in many ways. I can do interpreting, and still we continue to do interpreting uh, some political discourses, uh, speeches might be interpreted there and then. Uh, traditionally, film festivals would also uh, make use of interpreters uh, to interpret films that were arriving at the film festival too late and technology wasn't uh, as developed as it, as it is these days uh, to produce subtitling, for instance. And then you've got the Franco-German uh, company, TV company called Arte, uh, which now broadcasts in more languages than just French and, French and German, they have quite a lot of interpreters to work with their programs. So they have live audiences that can speak in German or can speak in French, and they are interpreting uh, there and then. Um, so this is one area that is being done, and we probably haven't paid that much attention from within audiovisual translation. Then you've got dubbing, uh, whereby we wipe out the soundtrack of the original video, and we change it for another soundtrack in another language. I come from a country where we do that mostly. So traditionally, the film will be, the audio will be taken away in English, then somebody will be speaking in Spanish, and we will pretend, we will believe a fiction within a fiction that those people are speaking Spanish, that Jennifer Lopez speaks Spanish fluently, the same at Brad Pitt and whoever you want. Yeah. Um, if you are not 
used to dubbing, you might think that it looks really weird, uh, but for my country uh, fellows, it's just a normal occurrence that they watch every day on the television. We need to do uh, certain things, um, and we talk about synchronies. So there are three types of synchronization. Uh, one, the most important one, is probably lip syncing. So you want to just move your lips in the same way as the originals or produce text in, in Spanish that will force the actors to move their lips the same way as the ones on the screen so that you don't see any uh, uh, clashes between the, what you hear and the movement of the lips. There is also what we call uh, isochrony, which is the length of the sentence. So you want to make sure that if they are speaking for three seconds, your translation can fit in comfortably in those three seconds. If it's too long, then you might see the people closing their mouth and then still continuing to talk. And then the third type of, of synchronicity that we discuss here is character synchronization. If I am doing all this, then you will probably understand that I am upset and, and I'm shouting. So you're not going to expect, oh, yes, it's very nice. Thank you. You probably expect some swearing or some sort of uh, intonation that represents what I am doing. And if it's an, uh, a, a, a period drama, then you were going to expect people speaking in a type of way that is uh, in consonance with that period and the way they used to speak uh, in the 18th century or whatever it is uh, presented. So all those are the dimensions that we take into consideration when we are dealing with dubbing. If you are dealing another area, and I think you are probably much more familiar than I am, is voiceover, which is very typical in countries like Poland as well and the Baltic states, they used to have it. And what this is, is you can hear the original a little bit, then you um, lower the volume of the original, and then you overlap the translation with another voice. So somebody's going to be talking over the original soundtrack that is still audible in the background. In many countries, this is only done in the news or something that is factual programs. A documentary that contains an interview, it might be done that way. It's very unusual to do it with fiction. But in some countries like Poland, which is called Lektor, that's, that's what they would do in television. And curiously enough, it's going to be done by just male voices. Uh, apart from some documentaries that are done by a female voice, and she's very famous in the country because it's the only female voice dealing with this. Surprising if you consider that translation tends to be a rather uh, feminine profession, uh, but then all the voices that you hear there are just male. And, and usually uh, you don't act on the translation. You will use a standard neutral delivery and, and very little intonation is included. So if people are crying or shouting, your, your translation will be sort of flat against that background. And the extra dimensions, the, the extra paralinguistic dimensions of shouting or laughing or whatever, you can get uh, directly from the original um, soundtrack. And then the final one here, there are many more, but I think this four encapsulates what we need uh, for, to know, is narration. And narration, basic, basically what we do is we wipe out completely the original and then we come up with another, trans, with, with a translation. Um, it's done in cases of uh, documentaries where you don't see anyone. So you've got the images, planet uh, water or planet, uh, what's it called? Planet, uh, uh, planet ocean or ocean planet. Uh, one of those documentaries that you can just hear somebody talking, you enjoy the images, the nature, the animals, the plants, whatever it is that they are showing us, and we translate it ignoring um, um, what has been done in the original. And then you've got some flexibility sometimes to expand your translation because the person speaking uh, in the original is not visible. So you can play a lot more uh, with your translation. And usually you have to make sure that if they're talking about whales uh, at a particular point, your translation is going to make reference to the whales that are appearing on the screen rather than later when they disappear from the screen. It's much more relaxed probably in terms of synchronicity than any of the other um, translation that we've got there. The second big approach is that we take a decision of uh, leaving the original as it is, and then I'm going to add information. And this is what is come to be known now uh, as timed text. This is a very, very new 
uh, jargon. This is new jargon in our industry. Uh, it was never called like this before uh, uh, the big guys came into the equation. And by those, I mean Netflix, that starting calling this text, uh, timed text. Yeah? Uh, we were talking more about titling uh, from subtitling, titling, uh, rewriting, some people as well, the rewriting brings in too many other connotations from certain uh, translation theoreticians, uh, which is gone, is beyond um, subtitling and is more in translation in general. Uh, but because you have to write, some people call it that way. But anyway, so this is this time text, which is we leave the original as it is, and then I'm going to be adding written text onto those images to make sure that you can understand. Traditionally, when we are dealing with screens of any type, cinema, televisions, now more and more computers, we talk about subtitling. And if I am doing this in live performances and it started in the theater, we call them SAR titles. Now they blurring quite a lot. SAR titles in the original essence, they were invented in Canada by one of the operas in um, uh, Montreal and at the, 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 the opera house in Montreal. And what they were doing in French was sous-titré, means that the text is at the bottom of the screen, sous. Then they said, well, we're gonna put it on the top of the stage. So we're gonna call it sir titling because sir means above. Yeah, it doesn't work as that well in English. It is not as transparent, but we copy from that. Now, the reality is that sir titles are not only on the top of the screen and many opera houses, you will go and then in front of your seat, you got a little screen whereby you can activate subtitles. You go to Barcelona Opera and then you can see the screen uh, in front of you and you can switch your subtitles to Catalan, to Spanish or to English while listening to the opera or watching the opera on stage. And then it's move on from opera to theaters and so on. Subtitling, I won't explain too much, much more than that because I'm gonna uh, pay more attention to this. This is going to be uh, the, the area that I'm going to be focalizing uh, a lot more. So these are the two main approaches with different um, areas. Some other authors have come up with up to 20, 10, 15 different types of transfer when we are dealing with audiovisual translation. But I think these are um, enough and, and, and clear. You've got here a little example uh, of dubbing uh, for you to know. Uh, and pay attention to the uh, how the lips are moving and how the information is an idea on how if you play, paid attention, if you know any of those languages, uh, you can see that, you know, at one point he finishes with ich and in, in the uh, mouth, what we can see is the mouth opening as if it was the I in, in German. So they follow to that nuance um, in, 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 in that detail. This is... Um, why, this has been one of the areas that probably has suffered most uh, through COVID, because traditionally to do the dubbing, you will have to go to a studio and, and be present in a dubbing studio, which is one of the things that we haven't been allowed to do is mingle and move to places. And, and what we're moving now and is developing quite fast is cloud-based dubbing. So people are recording from Kiev and then somebody's recording the actual recording in London or in Sheffield uh, as it happens or in New Zealand in Auckland uh, where there is another company uh, working with these plat platforms. I will be discussing cloud-based platforms and we will be doing that with uh, subtitling but this is another area that is growing really really fast uh, as we are talking. And then the other area, uh, a bit more traditional, if you want, a, a bit less traditional, and in some countries is still underdeveloped completely, is that or accessibility to the media. Uh, this comes from the concept that societies should be as inclusive as possible, and people with sensory disabilities should be also be considered, whether they are deaf or whether they are blind or whether they've got cognitive challenges. Uh, uh, they should be entitled to uh, understand and to follow what is being transmitted audiovisually. You can see now, I was only yesterday trying uh, playing with my PowerPoint and now PowerPoints very, very easily. I could be producing subtitles as I am talking. You don't need to do anything. They've incorporated a new system whereby I only need to touch a button and then my subtitles will be appearing at the bottom of the screen here when I am talking. Uh, they're a bit disruptive for me. So I just decided not to have that uh, because it does it automatically. So 
sometimes he won't recognize my voice or he will come up with something different. And I found it a little bit um, disrupting for my own liking. But that is, is, is straight away. You just get uh, the information in there is you want to try and test. And this is gaining momentum because of course we're all communicating through computers. Uh, we are all in different places and all the big players like Microsoft, Zoom, you could have Zoom um, and Zoom, actually, when you record, it also gives you a transcript of what is being said, automatically created. Yeah, so we're playing a lot with that to use that as well in subtitling. So in this accessibility area, uh, the traditional one that probably everybody's familiar with is sign language interpreting. And again, it's been, it's been very present on our screens during this pandemic. But we also have two other areas that probably we have analyzed a lot more within translation studies, which is subtitling for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, uh, also called closed captioning in American English, and, and then hence the, the symbol that you see there for the two Cs. This is in many countries by law. To give you an example, in the, in the UK, most TV stations and the public owned one, the BBC, will do 100% of all their programs will have subtitles. Yeah, so they don't do anything that it hasn't got subtitles. So if there is a tennis match or if there is a football match, then that program will have to have subtitles. And that means that it's live. So they always say that, you know, the BBC works 365 days a year uh, because even at Christmas, there will be people doing subtitling uh, for programs that are live. So uh, this subtitling uh, can be done uh, intralingually in within the same language, but quite a few people are also doing it across languages. So you get an American film that gets subtitles that are done for uh, Ukrainian people that cannot hear. And the, the standard subtitles wouldn't be um, enough to understand what is going on um, in there. And the other uh, approach is uh, this, this uh, standard subtitling will be or uh, this uh, SDH, as we call it in English, uh, will be more uh, for pre-prepared programs. There will be a film that I receive and I create the subtitles. But if it's a tennis match, which happens to be one of my favorite sports, so if it's a tennis tennis match, there isn't much that I can do beforehand. I have to wait and see who is playing, how they're playing and doing this. So usually the way we do it is through a practice that is called re-speaking. Yeah, and re-speaking is I am listening and I'm a, a hybrid between a subtitler and an interpreter. I am hearing what they are saying and I re-speak. I say the same that they are saying uh, in my language, in the same language as the original or as a translation. And I have to add, for instance, punctuation. Because when I'm talking, I'm not telling you there is a full stop, capital letter, there is a comma. So I need to incorporate that so that when it appears on the screen, the text is uh, comprehensible. Yeah, it can be read easily. Yeah, so I add the punctuation and so on. And, and I just speak to a mic that I've been training, uh, 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 voice recognition that I've been training so that it recognizes my voice and it doesn't commit too many mistakes. So this is an area that is growing as well very fast and, and is compulsory to be doing uh, when you're dealing with news and with programs that are uh, live. And then the other area that is also uh, developing in many countries. Some countries in Europe have been doing it for a long time. In some countries, it used to be a niche market, so not much was being done, but it's audio description for people who are blind and partially sighted. They also watch um, the, the news. They also watch the telly and they need access to those information. And you can see, you can do it, something in Ukrainian that is being done in Ukrainian for the deaf and hard of hearing, uh, for the blind people, but it might be a program that is an American program that it comes with subtitles. So if you are blind and you cannot read the subtitles, so what we are doing in countries like Sweden, where everything is done with subtitles, uh, in Flanders, in Belgium, in the UK as well, is uh, audio subtitling. So we give information about the film, but also add the information that comes in the subtitles. And I'm gonna show you a little video so that you can see more or less what this means uh, in, in real practice. This is from a film uh, by Disney. It's very, very short at the beginning, but just see what is happening and then listen to how they are explaining to us what's going on in all this multimodal and multimedia uh, product. From the creators of Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph, Disney. A carrot-nosed colide snowman shuffles up to a purple flower peeping out of deep snow. Hello. 
<laughs> he takes a deep sniff. His nose lands on a frozen pond. A reindeer looks up and pants like a dog. Seeing the reindeer slip on the ice, the snowman smiles and moves towards him. Though actually, he's running on the spot. The reindeer falls on his chin. The snowman uses his arm as a crutch. The reindeer paddles his front legs. Head over heels, the snowman crawls along the ice. The reindeer does the breaststroke. The snowman rolls his body, but flips onto his back. The reindeer's tongue sticks to the ice. The snowman holds his head. Twig arm and reindeer lips tug at the carrot. The carrot flies off and lands in soft snow. The reindeer goes after it with snowman and his body parts hanging on his tail. The snowman puts himself back together again and glumly contemplates his noseless state. The reindeer jams the carrot back in place and pants like a proud puppy. The snowman pats him with his stick thin arm, then goes to sneeze. He grabs his nose with both hands. His head shoots off. Frozen, coming this winter in 3D. Okay, so you've got there an idea of what is it that we do and how do we do it for people who don't have access otherwise. Now, audio description is growing quite fast because this idea of, of the need for inclusive societies, but also because big players like, for instance, Netflix, have already started incorporating it as a sort of standard function when you want to watch uh, programs on the on the Italian. Um, it's growing a bit less than uh, subtitling for deaf people, which, as I said, for instance, in the UK, 100% is done of, um, of programs with SDH, whereas around about 20% is being done for audio description. These both uh, areas are heavily uh, um, legislated and the European Union is passing legislation now, uh, the uh, audiovisual media uh, directive, whereby accessibility is going to be compulsory in all the European countries. So you can see why the need to be growing and creating modules and preparing people that are fully aware of what the needs and, and, and how to deal uh, with this area. So if you are thinking about developing audiovisual translation programs, um, I will be, uh, you know, thinking about the lines of the main areas, dubbing, if in your country a lot of dubbing is done, subtitling, which is very standard in most countries, but also incorporating things like audio uh, accessibility um, and, 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 you know, bringing in other strategies and skills uh, and, um, services for your future uh, translators. Now, uh, how countries deal with things? Um, some countries traditionally have, then, have, dealt, uh, have preferred dubbing, and then you've got here uh, quite a few uh, countries there, uh, and some other countries preferred traditionally subtitling. Um, a few ideas have been floated on how some countries prefer one thing or the other. Uh, nothing is really black and white. There are many reasons why they can go in different directions. But the reality is that they are mixing in, in many countries. And there isn't something that we can say is in one go. Now, the European Union has been interested in this, and they, they've done a few uh, reports on how do we consume audiovisual productions. And, and this is an area that I know is very, interested, uh, is very interesting for uh, other associations so to see how is the, can the world uh, consuming audiovisual production. So you've got here, this is a research done by the European Union, perhaps a little bit old now, a bit too black and white, so blue, they do dubbing, uh, they do subtitling, red, they do dubbing. Uh, we mix a little bit more and it will be, if it was granular, a bit more granular, it would be better for the industry to know if you want to make it into the Finnish uh, market, what should you be doing if you want to sell your products there or if you want to bring your cine your films there. But this is one area. And then in here, there is a, 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 a an attempt uh, to map the world in the way we consume audiovisual production. So again, you've got here information, a little bit more granular if you, if you want with more details in there, even if it's public or private. Uh, televisions, for instance, uh, but it still is, is an area that we haven't really researched in detail. There hasn't been any uh, projects that have tackled uh, this in, 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 you know, in, in detail. And then what you find here as well is uh, what I like also doing with my students is splitting them in groups and then asking them, you know, what are the pros of dubbing, what are the pros of subtitling, and then for them to start discussing the different um, areas there. Um, you've got here the ones that I thought of um, um, when comparing both. Uh, clearly, uh, subtitling is cheap 
much cheaper than uh, dubbing because it requires less people and less technicians and it's faster to be done. And that's why it's been always uh, privileged and uh, prioritized by many companies that want to sell uh, abroad. Um, but what we know now and the little research that has been done is that in many countries, uh, dubbed versions or revoiced versions of programs tend to reach more people. There is anecdotal research that has been done, but the same video floated on the internet with dubbed version and subtitled version, many more people watch it dubbed or revoiced, and many more people will also tend to redistribute, to share with other people and finish. Whereas the, dub, the people watching it dubbed, they tend not to finish as many, and they tend not to share with other friends, yeah, or with other colleagues. So this is some things that we are investigating in the world of uh, social media and um, dissemination. Uh, on the internet. As I said, you know, the origins are, are, they vary. Some people, you know, illiteracy rates in some countries at the time that when cinema was invented impeded uh, subtitling becoming uh, more standard. Uh, so the people that didn't have those issues uh, went for subtitling, whereas the people, the countries where uh, the, their populations weren't that, that educated went for dubbing, which is easier. Uh, to receive. Uh, there is also political repression. We know that many countries, Spain among those, but Germany, Italy, um, 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 yeah, uh, all these countries, uh, uh, other countries in the world, China, uh, I'm sure Russia, uh, and, and many others, they have legislation on what can be said on the television and what can be done. And in many countries, they made it compulsory that only the language of the country could be heard on the screen, which meant that subtitling couldn't exist because that means that you have to listen to English or to French or to another language and, and then do the subtitles. So by making it compulsory that everything that you heard on the screen had to be in your own language, in your national language, you manage to make your language much more disseminated and particularly think of countries like Italy, uh, Germany, that are divided by so many uh, dialects where do, they could just choose one in Germany, Hochdeutsch, in Italy, uh, Fiorentine, uh, um, Italian, in Spain, Spanish, as opposed to Catalan or Basque or Galician or any other languages. So it suited uh, these countries in that um, uh, way. And again, if you're interested, there is quite a lot of research being done um, in, in this area from the political perspective. There is also uh, economic factors. We said before, if dubbing is more expensive, some countries will prefer subtitling because it makes it much more uh, effective and, and less onerous on their finances. Uh, sometimes there's artistic and aesthetic values. People that like cinema, cinephiles, will say, oh, I will never watch a film that is being dubbed. That's not really the same pro product. It's not the same experience. And, and they will go that way. And then for a long time, we were saying that, you know, you just, we are creatures of habit. So if you are used to dubbing, you're not going to change you know, you're going to continue using dubbing. And if you are in a country that does subtitling, because from an early age, you're doing that, then you're, going, you're not going to change. What we know now is that it's not really that way. And quite a few countries are changing things the way they're doing. Dubbing countries, Spain, France, Germany, Italy, we're seeing more and more subtitling. And if you go to any of the uh, online providers, OTT providers these days, in those languages that traditionally was only dubbing, now you also find lots of subtitling. And the market is flourishing in subtitling in these languages. Uh, the, the reality is that we find now both dubbed versions and subtitled versions, but also subtitling countries, they're also going into lots of dubbing. Greece, subtitling all their lives. Now they discovered Latin American soap operas, Turkish soap operas, and they prefer to dub those rather than use subtitles so that you can continue doing other things and you don't have to be glued to the screen reading the text, but you can hear and listening. It's a little bit, my grandmother used to listen to uh, radio soap operas. So she will put the radio full blast and she will be doing things in the house and listening to those stories that were, were told. So a little bit like that. Now we have discovered that, you know, countries that traditionally don't translate much, and when they do, they go to subtitling, like the UK, the USA. Now they're moving as well to dubbing. And I'm not sure if you've been following uh, Netflix um, and, and, and their approach to dubbing. So many foreign films now in Spanish, in French, in German, 
you can also watch them dubbed into English. And for the English people, it's still something awkward, very strange. They're not quite into that, although some people are starting to do it. Uh, and in the USA, it's going very well. You know, uh, they have a uh, money heist, like Casa de Papel, the Spanish one. It became what it is because of the dubbed version in many countries, not when people go into that. So we've seen a new boom of, of dubbing, which wasn't there before. And then uh, it also depends on the new media. So, you know, cinema, television, whether it is public, for instance, some countries in Latin America, public television will be dubbed. Commercial television, where people can pay and they assume that they're going to be from different cultural background, then they use subtitles. Yeah. Uh, in Poland, television will use a voiceover for films. You go to the cinema, the same film comes out with subtitles. So it, it really varies according to places and so on. But the reality, as I said, is that subtitling tends to be the favored one because of it's fast, cheap, and very flexible, yeah, despite this growing of revoicing. Now, let's move now to subtitling. Um, you might be uh, aware, if not, I will make you aware, and this is a little bit of plugging in my latest book, uh, and subtitling just came out uh, before Christmas and uh, is now available. Uh, as you can see, it comes with, uh, uh, we reached an agreement with Una and with WinCaps, uh, which are two providers of software for subtitling. And the book comes with a companion website, which contains lots of information. I will give, I'll, I'll be giving you much more information about this tomorrow uh, and how you can exploit the material and the content that comes in this uh, book multimedia project uh, so that you can use it for your teaching and so on. Yeah, because it contains lots of exercises exploring the, te the technology as well. Now, what is subtitling? So I've got this little video, uh, Vancouver Film Festival, to just jokingly make us be more aware about subtitling. The following film may contain scenes with subtitles. Or scenes that for some cruel reason don't have subtitles. Or scenes with subtitles that make the character seem less intelligent. Or scenes with subtitles that give you the strange feeling you're missing out on something. An open mind is advised. Okay. So I give you an idea on our, uh, you know, hobby horse. Uh, of you know what can go wrong in subtitling, the feeling that you've always been cheated out, that there's not enough information, uh, that they don't represent, that there are mistakes, if particularly you understand the original language, and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, it, before you yep. start to, to go on, there are some questions in the question and answer section. Okay, could you, yeah, uh, let me see then. I could see them coming, but then I have to I go. Let me see, uh, on the chat. No, no, in question and answers. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I've got, I can see three here, one from Olga. Do you know any interesting cases related to provision of closed captioning or audio description. I think it was before I actually came uh, discussed that. Uh, but yes, as, as I mentioned there, these are areas that are growing. I'm not really sure. I'm not familiar with the situation in the Ukraine. I would imagine that is some, as many other countries is probably an area that is developing 
and that is happening. So um, watch this space. I know countries that they've never done it. Turkey, for instance, they are developing. China, they are now, they've created a body uh, to look at accessibility and access to the media. In Spain, we've had it as well since 2005, a center for subtitling and audio description. Um, and as I said, the European Union is legislating, making it compulsory. So it's gonna be happening more and more. Uh, in this area. So if there is little in your countries, I would, is, I would suggest uh, that you start looking at, at this and see how things are done. Um, if, for instance, a uh, Ukrainian TV series film documentary was going to be uh, shown on an um, internet platform, uh, the way, for instance, Netflix is doing it is that you, as a producer, need to send your material with the audio description in Ukrainian and the subtitles as well in Ukrainian. And then they will deal with the translation into other languages. But as the, the product itself needs to be all included there. So not long ago, I received a request by somebody uh, from um, uh, Serbia, and they were desperate looking for somebody who could do the description for a Serbian film in Serbian, because it was something that it was going to go to Netflix, and they wanted already the, the, the whole thing coming with the films. So that is something that you, know, you might want to take um, uh, into consideration. Uh, the difference between subtitles and open closed captions uh, as well for Olga, uh, basically with closed captions, we're going to see more about subtitling and then you will know exactly what is require, required. So you can then make a better com comparison later on. But basically for closed captions, you will need to incorporate information of uh, that a, a blind, um, a deaf person cannot hear. So if I am speaking with an accent, it might be important that then later you know the, 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 the criminal is me, it was Jorge, because they knew that he spoke English with an accent. So you might want to say, well, Jorge, and then speaks with Spanish accent. And then you just tell him that, you know, the person speaks differently. It might well be that now I just leave you here, leave my uh, headphones and everything because I heard the door ring the doorbell ring uh, and why is Jorge living? So you will put a subtitle say, well, doorbell ringing and then just justifies why I'm going there. Or if, if there is a siren blowing on the streets or whatever. So all that information, if somebody speaks in a different language, multilingual exchanges, uh, I am on my own now, but if we were three people, I know something that we do in Spain for those of us, for those of you who know Spain, and I know quite a few of you do and have spent time in Spain there, you know that we will speak at the same time. So we were all here and talking at the same time. If you are deaf, even if you see subtitles, you wouldn't know whether it was me, my friend, or somebody else on the screen. So you will probably add labels, Jorge, what I'm saying, Pedro, what Pedro is saying, so that you know exactly who is saying what. Otherwise, you might not know because we're all at the same time. So that makes that uh, difference there. Yeah. Um, if you want, tomorrow I can show you a few examples quickly of that difference uh, with the screenshots on films and, and what information is there. Uh, Katerina, uh, obscenities and so on, uh, censorship of translator self-restriction. Um, again, we're jumping the gun here because I haven't really explained to you what subtitling is. Uh, and you will see this is an area that is always problematic. And, and I will discuss it later on. It, it's, it's a bit of both censorship in certain countries, but now there is not as much, uh, such excuse uh, when uh, guidelines from Netflix will tell you, please don't uh, censor any of the content and don't um, use euphemisms. If somebody's saying something really strong, we want a translation that is also strong in there. But in some other countries, public television tends to be a little bit more shy about this, and they will use bleeping, so you don't hear, you use a beep, or you get uh, an F, asterisk, 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 ing, uh, which I always wonder, you know, is there anybody in the world that doesn't know what that means? Because it's probably the same as saying the, the, the F word. But anyway, those are the strategies uh, that you will be finding um, in there. Uh, but I will mention a little bit later as well. And Anastasia Chevanova, uh, should a translator have voice acting experience to create audio description for blind and visually impaired people or is translation and narration done by people, uh, by different people? Actually, both happen in the industry. Traditionally, uh, because it was a niche market, it was the same person doing uh, the translate doing the uh, script, the audio script, and then also putting the voices. But now because they need lots of people and, and they're working many more. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, 
I'm not one of those with a nice voice, and many people are uh, that don't have a voice to be uh, recording. So they will be asking people, okay, can you please write the audio description? And then somebody with a nice voice will be putting the audio description on top. Um, so you find both approaches. If anything, I would say that is growing that is separate that you as a translator translate, create. Uh, and again, here you can find two different app, uh, options. You, they give you a film and you translate, you audio describe it, you create a script, or they might give you the film with the audio description in English. And then they will be asking you to translate the, the script in English into Ukrainian. Yeah, which sometimes people don't like because you know, you're not only translating uh, the text, but you are also, uh, translating the way they watch the film, you know, and we watch films differently. There is research done on Spanish films, audio described for an English audience and audio describes for a German audience. And the Germans describe things differently and pay attention to different things to the English people. So if you then translate from German, uh, you're going to pay more attention to the cemetery in this particular project. If you audio describe in English, you're going to pass by the cemetery scene and don't pay attention to that. So again, that depends on how you want to go about it. But yeah, it's an area that is so new that people are trying in different ways to how to go about it. But if like me, you don't have a nice voice, you can still do scripts. And if you've got a nice, vo a nice voice, you can do both. And if you speak other languages, you can do the three things. You can translate, you can create, and you can also revoice. Okay, are there any, any uh, norms for nice voice? What is a nice voice for voice solos? It really depends. I, do, I, I don't know. You know, there is a lot of, uh, that is being done, for instance, in synthetic voices. And people are creating voices. And then they say it's velvety. I'm not really sure what velvety means or is uh, sensual or is whatever. I guess if you have done uh, drama studies or uh, acting, maybe those things ring a bell and then you can modulate your accents and then you become more se a bit sexier or a bit aggressive or a bit something. So they do, that's the way they are testing these days. And on some occasions they say that blind people cannot really tell the difference between synthetic voices and real voices. So that's the way they are uh, exploring this area. And of course, you know, speech technologies are developing so fast these days that anything that relies on, on a speech is also developing. Audio description, audio subtitling, uh, we, we're struggling, dubbing, uh, you know, as long as the technology moves ahead, we're also moving. And usually we go behind, but we are seeing how things are, are going there. But yes, I do tell my students, if they think that they've got a nice voice and so on, they should be really looking into learning. And there are some places where you can just uh, learn how to modulate your voice uh, and then play a little bit with us because it is, it is happening more and more. And it doesn't need to be just audio description, corporate videos as well. For many corporate videos that they would like some voices, they don't want to go to famous people, but just people that will be nicely done, exams, you know, videos that are meant to be for exams and so on. They're always looking for voice talents, as they are, as they are called in the industry. And yes, if you think that this is an area that it could, you could exploit and use as your service, by all means. Yeah. Um, I think that resolves most of the questions there, but please alert me again if there, if there are any or stop me and, and then ask. So here you have a definition of subtitling. Um, I'm going to try to go a bit fast on this because I'm, I'm leaving the PowerPoint the PowerPoints behind and you can read in more detail uh, because I, I'm, I'm aware of the time and I really want to show you uh, the platform so that you can see how it works and so on. So here you have the definition, um, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, it might be defined as a translation practice and you might wonder why uh, I say that, I'll explain, uh, but basically what we do, we translate anything that is being said or anything that is being shown on the screen. And what I do then is produce a written text that usually I put at the bottom of the screen. Me yeah, and give a translation. Yeah, that's basically what this quote is saying here. Now, uh, maybe define as a translation practice. And this is something that might shock you, uh, but it was never considered translation until very late in the 20th century, in the 90s, 
where people started considering this translation and teaching it. But before it wasn't taught. The first courses in audiovisual translation started in the, in the 80s in France, uh, in Lille, a very small group cohort of students. We know until the 90s that this starts growing. And this means that it's been going on for about 20, 25 years, no more than that. More success in some countries than in others. And in many places, they didn't consider it translation. So it wasn't part of translation um, because it was meant to be an adaptation. It was something that people did in, in work, in, in the industry, but it wasn't really translated. The changes were too big to what translation understood as literary translation or medical translation is. And because it was so creative or so different to the original, it wasn't taught. Yeah. And that's why we've been lagging behind. And I know uh, some of the companies now, they say they lack talent. They don't have enough people to be working in this in certain countries because universities in Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, millions and millions of people, no universities teach audiovisual translation, very few. And if they do, they're very theoretical and they don't know how to deal with the technology and how to deal with the actual translation. So that's why many companies are struggling and, and asking, you know, we need people with the expertise in lots of languages, but they're not, they're simply not there. And we've been, I have to say, a bit slow on the take in, in academia. And uh, again, tomorrow, for those of you who are more into didactics, I'll show you some of the documents that traditionally have been produced for translators, where you get all the information, what we call dialogue lists, or combined continuity and spotting dialogue lists. And, and those are documents that can be 300 pages produced only for us translators. And they contain information that they expect you to translate. The, book, the big blockbusters from the USA, they've always been very, very good at dealing with this. But some European films, or European companies, they send you a film and tell you translate. And usually what they give you is a really poor dialogue list. And then you find films where the songs are not translated, where text that is on the screen, they didn't realize and they don't translate it either and so on. So that's why still we seem to be missing uh, lots of information uh, in, in some of the subtitles because people didn't think about what is not said. Um, so uh, we, we kept only translating dialogue rather than anything else uh, that is also needed there. Uh, one of the few articles, and I like quoting it a lot, it is by somebody called Dirk de la Bastita in 1989. And um, he, he's never, well, he has written a little bit about this, but he just wrote a, a very sort of um, off the cuffs article and uh, didn't continue writing more on audiovisual translation. And what he was wondering at this time in 89, it was why is everybody talking now? People start talking about audiovisual translation. What is this? Why is that important? Um, is, is it different to what we do in other areas? And then what he comes to analyze is, okay, we've got, with audiovisual programs and the audiovisual object, I've got two dimensions. On the one hand, I've got the audio, the acoustic, and on the other hand, I've got the visual. And they bring in information in different ways. Acoustically, I can see verbal signs. I can hear verbal signs like dialogues or monologue. Dialogue exchanges monologues. And that is what I need to translate if I'm doing subtitling, dubbing, dubbing or voiceover. But I can also hear lots of music. I can hear music, instrumental uh, music, songs, I can hear background noise. And normally we accept that as being Esperanto. Uh, everybody will understand those noises. We don't do anything normally. It's, it's not really true because I could be very critical now. I will be criticizing somebody and say that there is a family where this, the daughter was married or is still married to a thief and then the, uh, the father uh, uh, went uh, out of the country uh, because he was followed by uh, corruption and so on. And you might not know who I am talking. I could put the national anthem behind me and then those of you who know that is the, the uh, anthem of Spain that you can relate to who I'm talking. But I'm not saying anything, but it's the, the sound. And then with the sound, you can pipe, put all the puzzle together. Yeah, and that's what many directors use. And particularly in countries where they've got censorship, that's one way of getting the information through sounds and ways of presenting the information. 
Traditionally, we don't do anything unless you're doing SDH. This is exactly the information where you as a translator come on the screen and incorporate that information. Is that the national anthem of Spain? Is that what type of music is that? Is a bit, is it nostalgic? Is it classical music? Who is singing? All that information is what you need to bring in. Yeah, uh, if I'm speaking with, if I stutter when I speak, then maybe you need to indicate that, that he's stuttering when he's speaking because it's probably important for the development of the plot. Yeah, and then what we also have, we also see, yeah, and when we see, we see variable signs, and then those we need to translate. Banners in a demonstration, uh, I receive a message on my mobile, and then the camera goes to the mobile, and then you can see how they're changing messages on their um, telephones and so on. So all that information that is written needs to be translated. But we also see lots of things. I can tell you, listen, don't go. And most of you probably don't know what I'm saying. If anybody understands Spanish or has been to Spain, they know what I said. They, they know why they don't have to go. They don't have to go because it's full. And this is the symbol we do is full. That's a symbol we do in Spain. So I, can, I, I haven't said it, but my information is completed. Everybody knows what I've said. Um, so gestures are, 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 can be very, very cultural. We normally don't do anything unless again you are audio describing for people who are deaf uh, who are blind and then all those images those kinesics those gestures the background it might be important what i've got behind me uh, or in harry potter the action all that information is the one that needs to be verbalized needs to be conveyed um, to the to the audience yeah so those are the the semiotic dimensions now what is missing here crucially is the target text. And P never discusses what can you do with the actual translation? And we know, you know, if I write on, a, on an image and I write no, N-O, it's flat, it's boring, and it's nothing. But if I said no, and I write an N, then I write a big O, a smaller O, a very smaller O, another smaller O, and then a really small O, then my message is different. I'm bringing a no that is down, or if I do something like karaoke and I'm sending the information differently. Now, that's what many people are now investigating on how you produce another experience, an immersive experience with the film or with the program, and the text is helping you uh, gain other emotions in, in the information. Now, audiovisual translation becomes problematic when the audio and the visual are there. Otherwise, you translate as normally. We're not translating. If somebody says, uh, this is not for me, then you translate, this is not for me. You're not going to translate differently because it's audiovisual. We follow audiovisual, but it's only on occasions that the audio and the visual come together to just make our lives more exciting and challenging. This is a clip from Pulp Fiction. Okay, so how would you translate this? If you were to do subtitles <laughs> or if you were to translate, with dubbing, what would you do at the end? She's trying to convince him to go to the restaurant. He doesn't want to. And she is going to sort of not insult him, but he's going to, you know, um, define him in a way that is probably not what he would like. So here you have it. This is Jack Rabbit Slims. And Elvis man should love it. Come on, man. Let's go get a steak. You can get a steak here, daddy -o. Don't be a... So don't be a, she doesn't say anything else, continues. We see extra diegetically that is here, this symbol. Uh, you will come up with the expression, don't be such a square, don't be a square, even though it's not a square because it's actually a rectangle. But yeah, you can see I'm being a square uh, in Spanish, I'm, I'm lucky. It's more or less the same as in English. So you, you have a square mind, you, you're a bit closed, you're a bit obtuse, you're not open to new things, blah, blah, blah. So I, I could probably leave it that way and people will understand. But I do know for a fact that in China, that wouldn't mean anything. And if I just translate, don't be such a, and I don't say anything, dot, 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 then I know many Chinese would look at this and say, well, don't be what, you know? And, and that what doesn't exist in English because I know but she is saying because of that drawing in there. So that's when it becomes problematic, that's when it becomes challenging. I've got another example here 
chicken run and then you've got this little one why is it funny at the end if you haven't seen the film this is the cockerel trying to teach these hens how to fly so that they can uh, abandon uh, this um, uh, farm where they are kept prisoners okay and he cannot fly himself so this hen is getting suspicious that something is amiss in here so that's what you see i thought you were going to teach us how to fly that's what i'm doing <laughs> isn't there usually some flapping involved hey do i tell you how to lay eggs relax we're making progress really i can't help feeling we're going around in circles now you might laugh at this. Uh, I cannot escape that feeling that we are going around in circles. They are going around the, in circles. The camera moves. And it's, that's why it's funny. It's quirky. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting as a film. Now, here you have the translation into Spanish, which I will back translate to you so that you can see what it means. Uh, she's saying, really? Yes. I have got the sensation, the feeling that we're not going anywhere, that we're not going to any part, Yeah, that we're not going anywhere. If I were to see that written, then it's a, it's, a, it's a good translation. That's what it means. That metaphor, we're not going any, we're going around in circles, it means that they're not doing anything, that they're not going to where they want to go and blah, blah, blah. So it is a good translation, linguistically speaking, but to me, it's, it's, it's feeling something that is not, it doesn't do justice to the images. What I could do in Spanish, and then I will play with the metaphor and the images is something like, uh, le estamos dando demasiadas vueltas, which means we are going, we are giving it too many rounds in our head. We're thinking too much and we're not doing anything. But by using thinking too much is going or giving it too many rounds in the head, then those rounds go with the images and make it visual. That's why I prefer this translation. It's not that the other one is wrong because the person clearly understood the original. It is that it doesn't match well the images. And that's here when the images and the text need to become symbiotic. Yeah, and that's what I prefer this. So that's what we need to raise. That's the awareness when we are doing the translation on how we can bring our translation close to those images and the images embedded in our translation. Yeah. What are the main characteristics? Um, I'm going to move this because I sometimes you don't see. This comes from somebody called uh, Jan Iversen, which by some of us is known as the that of translation. He wrote a book in the 90s and uh, on subtitling and he's been really, really famous, Jan Iverson. He's got it on his website. And, and I like this idea, like packing all the ideas and the finest nuances into two lines is damn difficult. And he cannot finish writing anymore because the two lines are complete and done. There is no much more information that I can put there. If you look, I like this because if you look at it, it looks somehow old. It looks like teletext. It looks, when I was a child, I had a little machine that I put a, a plastic uh, um, a plastic belt there. And then if I press really hard, the, the consonants and the vowels will grow there. And then because it's, it was adhesive, I would write my name and put it on my books. And those, my books had my name and things like that. And I like using it because it gives that idea of something archaic, something old that is really heavily dependent on uh, technology. And that is what subtitling is. You know, for many years in, in, in subtitles, uh, you couldn't do uh, certain things because uh, analog technology didn't allow for italics. So italics wouldn't appear on television on some subtitles because it wasn't, uh, you couldn't do it. Somebody, when they did uh, analog technology, they just came up with, you could only write 35 characters per line. So 35, when this, we say 35 per line, so looks like, or sounds a bit like symbolic, esoteric. It's just that somebody, they didn't think. And when they thought there is something here and we could do add text, uh, it was done in such a way that only 35. Yeah, and that's why we've had so much theory on 35, sometimes 37 characters. Now you can write as much as you want. And that's how technology is evolving and helping us in many ways. Now, two of the main characteristics of subtitling are reduction yeah, and the other one, the change of medium. Reduction, it would always depend on, uh, we don't reduce all the time. And this is something that I find my students always um, overdo it at the beginning to show, to prove that they like uh, subtitling very much. 
they over reduce the information and they delete too much information. And of course, if you do that is remember the clip that I put at the beginning from the film festival. If somebody is speaking a lot, even if they are speaking in Ukrainian and I don't understand any Ukrainian at all, believe you me, I will know if you give me a subtitle that is too short, I will know that something is going wrong because I can hear a lot, I'm expecting a lot. And if somebody says, Niet, and then I find in my subtitle, well, really, I'm not in agreement with you. I might think, well, actually, that might not be what they said because I can hear something that is very short and the subtitle is coming with a very, very long text there. So that's what we call in the industry, the gossip effect. There is always this background information. And if you're translating from English, that's even more problematic because a lot of people will understand English and they will expect certain words to be also on the subtitles and so on. So this gossip effect is going to be always there. So I need to be careful that I don't delete more than I need to. It is true that we need to uh, reduce and sometimes it will depend on the delivery. If I speak really slowly, then I will be able to translate 100% all the information. But if I speak really fast when I'm doing now and I tell you that I came to England when I was about, uh, when I finished my degree in Spain and I came to work in a university in Rohampton University and then I went to Luxembourg and then I came back to here and I started working in Imperial College and then I went to uh, UCL College, then if you need to subtitle that in the time that I said it, you're gonna have to condense a lot. You will hate me forever and have to condense. What we find now is that in many films and TV series, they do speak fast because they only have half an hour, 45 minutes per episode, and then they need to incorporate all the information. Yeah. So A, how fast are they speaking? And B, how fast is the audience going to be able to read? And this is something that we're always struggling because, of course, uh, grandparents, your younger children or siblings, they're going to be struggling reading on the screen, whereas you, most of you are very familiar with internet and mobiles, always reading on the screens, and other people that haven't had the opportunity, they're not going to be fast. So who do I keep happy when I do my subtitles? And I need to reach an agreement, a compromise on what is going to be done. Yeah? The reality is that we do both total and partial uh, deletion, and you will have to teach your students that some information has to go it cannot stay on the screen, even if they say it. Yeah, and they will have to be careful on what do they keep and what is it that do they make away. And then the other change that I think is unique in translation is that we change of medium. We are hearing something that is spoken and I'm going to go to written. And of course, the spoken, we speak differently. We say things that we wouldn't write. And part of that, for instance, swearing. Swearing is very common when you're speaking, but not so much when you have to write it. And then how do you relate to that? But also when we speak in certain languages, in Spanish, we usually delete some consonants in some verbs when we're speaking. Uh, at the end, uh, in French, uh, they delete the uh, negation, the first negation, je n'ai pas fini, je pas fini. But you know, when do you need to? And lots of things that we do in certain languages. How do you reflect that in the subtitles? Tradition has been that we don't reflect it. Yeah, and that's why people feel cheated. They say, oh, the police and the thief, the lawyer and the criminal, they speak the same. There's no level in nuances in register because we don't play. Usually we don't play with the morphology. We play more with the lexical, the semantic dimension. So we find a word that is more or less registered, but I don't play with elisions uh, or uh, droppings or consonants or whatever. It's, it's very, very rare in subtitling. So that's the challenge on how do we do that? You know, in all other areas, dubbing, somebody's speaking, somebody's speaking in the translation. Uh, a poem is written, is written. But in subtitling, we get differently. Now, um, um, in the book that I mentioned to you, uh, I've got information there. I'm going to be uh, following or I'm going to be giving you so that you can uh, use um, guidelines these days. They are available. Netflix change the name of the game and then you've got information in here on their website uh, with how to do subtitles from scratch. So all the technical dimension, that's why I'm not going to go too much into detail, but all the general requirements are there and how to deal with the time of the subtitles. And then as you can see, they've got lots of languages, including Ukrainian. Um, so if you go to the website, they will have the Ukrainian guidelines, they've got Russian, they've got Czech, they've got Spanish, they've got Chinese, up to 30 something language something languages that you can watch there uh, or download if you want 
to use them for your teaching. Uh, many people are using them. They're not the only ones. Um, as I mentioned to you, the audiovisual translation, but this association of audiovisual translators on their website, they've got also guidelines from other associations in Swedish, in German, in Croatian, in Czech, in French, and in some other languages. So again, if you want to expose your students to more than one set of guidelines, it's more than okay. Many companies, large corporations will have their own guidelines. Um, so students will need to be familiar with what is standard, but also they will have to be disciplined to apply the guidelines that a particular company wants to use for their particular programs. So this is not this doesn't have to be presented to the students as there is a conflict of interests, but it's rather that, you know, this is normal or standard, but be alert because other people might ask you to do differently and then it's perfectly okay as well. Yeah. Um, so what are the spatial considerations? We've got two main considerations to bear in mind is the space that we've got available and then the time that is, is available for us to produce our translation. When it comes to the space, uh, how many subtitles, how many lines can I write? Usually I play with my students and I tease them a little bit. I ask them, you know, how many? Chances are that most students will tell me two. Yeah, um, it's not always true. In some other languages they use more or something, but usually it's two. And yes, it's true. You do two. Why? There is no reason why we do. We could do many more. This is just one we have been bringing in lots of things from the past and we continue to a large extent. So we do a maximum of two lines, but it doesn't really mean that we only need to do two, we could do three, we could do four, you know, and then if you go to the internet, you will find two, you have three, four, five, even six subtitles. The nature of communication is changing. In a clip like this one here with Stephen Jobs, I'm not really interested. This video is about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. One, well, one minute, 30 seconds into the video, I'm sick and tired of him, his bald head. And it's not going to be changing. So what I do want to know is what is exactly that he's saying. The images are not, are not important. They're inconsequential. What I really want to know is exactly what is he saying. So that's why now you will find lots of different approaches. Commercially, we still keep to two lines, but you will find that many other people are using them in many other ways of doing it. And in my you know, my way of seeing this in the future is that we will be much more flexible because people are going to become much more familiar and, and subtitles are going to become much more common occurrence in, 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 in screens, yeah, the way we're watching them. But for the purposes of this exercise and so on, I would always be recommending that students don't do more than two, but they don't get shocked or horrified if they see more than just two. Uh, where do you put them? The subtitles, this varies according to companies and, uh, and countries as well, traditions, but normally it's two lines at the bottom of the screen centered. Yeah? And we don't tend to put them um, indent to the left. Yeah, so that's the way. But you can get some countries, Japan, for instance, sometimes in China, but they do vertically. So again, you need to be a bit uh, aware of those things. But as I said, you know, chances are that we're going to be working in this way. They're always centered, unless they tell you all the things. There's going to be this way. One thing that I also alert my students, and they're never aware, they, they, they can never think of that because they are on the receiving end. They are learning and they are getting the information. But I always tell them, well, imagine you finish and you are the expert. And then you've got this little company in Kiev or in Madrid or in uh, Barcelona or whatever. And then they, oh, I see that you are a subtitler. Can you subtitle this video for me? Can you tell me how you do it? Yeah, and can you give me the ideas? Why do you put only two lines? Why don't you put three? I think I prefer three lines. How can you, as an expert, convince them that they only need two? or that they need to be centered and not put on the top or whatever. So to learn as well on how they're going to be selling their services and how they can justify how they're doing things. And this is something that they never think too. Why? Oh, I don't know. Uh, what are you going to put the subtitles here? Why are they there? Why not on, on this side? Well, I don't know. So well, that way you're not going to be selling your services very well to, the, uh, to a client, to a potential client that doesn't know anything about subtitling. That's why they come to you because you are the expert. If you're working for a company that knows about subtitling, then that's fine. But if not, if it's a little client that just produce videos, then you're not going to be convincing uh, them. And, and then the background, as I said, bottom of the screen, unless something happened at the beginning. And here we've got cinema 
uh, in, in standard, in, in priorities, cinema is very traditional. Television, internet is much more flexible. So cinema, if something is happening at the beginning, at the bottom of the screen, it goes to the top. Television, internet, DVD, Blu-ray, uh, we play a lot more. So in here, the English is the original. This is a translation and I'll put it just above. It looks nice. I don't have to go to the top of the screen, but I'm gonna put it in there. If, uh, sorry, if something is happening uh, in this one here, I've got uh, the same thing, but now is the dialogue between them. So what I'm gonna do is put it in there. I'll move it a little bit and place it there. But if we were dealing with uh, cinema, then what I'm gonna do is if I know that text is gonna be appearing, then I'm gonna put it on the top of the screen to make sure that it's not conflicting the information. Yeah. And then students should be alert on when the, there are this uh, on on screen text that ne doesn't need to or, or my subtitles don't need to cover. There is a concept that they will need to use as well that we use in the industry, which is that of safe area. I cannot write from one stream to the screen to the other uh, stream of the screen. So all programs professional programs, cloud-based programs, the one that I'm gonna show you, they all create what is called a safe area, which is usually 10% on all the um, edges are banned. You cannot use that for translation. You cannot write beyond this green uh, area. So you cannot write below there or on the right there or on the left here, yeah? So they create that, that means that my area to translate is reduced to about 80% of the screen, depending on where I am I'm writing. Many programs will work like the, uh, well, they used to like uh, traffic lights. So red, I'm okay, uh, green, I'm okay. Red, problem, danger, and yellow, I have to do something. Yeah? These days, because they give us so much information, they're more like a rainbow. You've got all colors telling you what you're doing right or wrong. Uh, but they will always be alerting you to things and the red continues to be danger, something wrongly done. So again, most programs will be by default, they come already telling you how much is that safe area and you don't need to do much. But sometimes you might have to change on the same area. So if I know that I've got 80% more or less of my screen to use for my translation, how many characters can I write? And I can well, depend on the type and size. You know, if I make big fonts, then I'm gonna be able to write less than if I do a small. I have to reach a compromise that is not too small or too big. So if we are working with Latin-based, Cyrillic-based or Semitic languages, Arabic, then usually we go for uh, neutral fonts that don't have serifs. Serifs are um, um, little ornaments. You know, like the L will have something here at the end, like a little something there. So we avoid any fonts that have got extra dimensions and we go for very basic ones. The ones that we tend to use more likely is Arial, Verdana, Helvetica. Uh, Netflix will ask you to do Arial, even though they created their own font, which is called Netflix Sans. Yeah, they have created their own font and they use it for all their films. The BBC also created their own font, which is called Tiresias and it's a font only to do subtitles, yeah? So we use that one. I usually tell the students, and by default, many programs come like that, Arial, yeah? And then if you do Arial, we work with pixels, points, and then we do Arial 30. This is when we're working with images and video players and so on. It doesn't mean it's not like Word. If in Word I did Arial 30, it will be immense, you know? Arial 12 is already big. Um, but if I am working in a, in a screen and so on, uh, I will set it to Arial 30, and that's what we normally do. So if I am writing like that, Arial 30, then it means that I'm gonna be able to do more or less between 35 to 42 characters. If I write more than 42, chances are that I'm gonna go beyond the safe area, and that's gonna be wrong. So that's why you will find many companies will tell you do 39. Yeah, but Netflix is pushing the boundaries and he's gone up to 42. Yeah, but the DVD industry, the Blu-ray industry, television, they are much happier with 39, 37, 39. It's Netflix that is pushing and going to 42. And that means characters, including the blank spa spaces. So uh, you've got per line is one, two, three, four, 
the blank space, five, six, seven, and eight. Yep, yeah, so I have to count. You don't need to count them. The program will count it for you. If you happen to work with double byte languages like Japanese, Chinese, Korean, then you usually do, you've got here Chinese about 35 with the font, Korean, Japanese, and maximum 16 characters per line. Okay, that's the standard for those languages. I'm jumping just in case somebody's listening uh, from those languages. Now, one thing that has changed dramatically for us is that traditionally we work with mono space. That meant 38 characters is 38 key boards, key pressures on, on my board. Doesn't matter whether an L or an M. That clearly is a bit silly because an L occupies less space than an M. And now what subtitles programs do is they don't use any more mono spaced. And mono spaced was what we had all life. And we still consider 42 characters considers or accepts that they all occupy one space. Yeah, but the reality is that if you can see here, the M or the P occupies an I and an L is the half, the space of an E in there. So now what the programs do is actually they work with the safe area and proportional lettering, all of them. So that means that for instance, I've created this fake one if you look at the top line, it looks slightly bigger than the other one, and it counts 42 characters, whereas the other one counts 45, three more, but it's actually smaller. Because what I've got here, it occupies less space because I've got I, L, T, F, and things like that, that makes the text shorter. So in reality, if I tell you do no more than 42, it's really is a fallacy the subtitling program would allow me more. Yeah, and some people, if you are professional and you work with software, then sometimes they tell you as much as you can, keep the safe area and write as much as you can. And if you write many I's and F's and T's, then your, line, your lines will be longer than if you write M's, N's, W's and whatever. Yeah, so that's another way of working. I always tell my students, okay, work with maximum 39 or 42. But the reality is that in many companies, they will be, tell, they will be told, oh, you don't need to uh, just write as much as you can. Yeah, because this safe area is respected there. I hope that is clear. I, I don't know if, if any questions have been coming up. Uh, there have been some, uh, if you're willing. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, there are three questions. Which is uh, which on you? Uh, uh, okay, what well, would you recommend to read or audio description? Uh, what would you recommend to read or know the description? Okay, uh, there are a few uh, books and um, uh, I will show you. There is one by Louise Fryer. I'll make notes mm -hmm. and I will give uh, some bibliography uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I will send it there. But there is one by Louise Fryer um, called Audio Description. Yeah, and, and thank you, uh, Te Ditna, Ditina. And I will create a, a, a list of, of reading. Yeah, if you want to read on the different areas, I will make it uh, subtitling. Just recently, um, a book on uh, subtitling for the heart of hearing came out and it's free, it's open access. So you can access that. Uh, is AD being taught as a course anywhere in the world? Uh, yes, it is being taught in certain countries. Uh, at my university, we do. Uh, many other universities, but well, many, some other universities also do. Uh, in Spain, in Barcelona, um, and in other places. And then there are courses now and again, uh, some conferences, they may have a three hour course uh, or workshop before uh, the conference so that people can um, can learn a little bit on, on audio description. There is actually, if you are interested, there is a project from the European Union called AT Lab. AT as AD, lab, la laboratory. And then they've got lots of material, which is free. It's open access and I, they've got a, a course. So divide it in modules and so on with videos and so on, uh, and you can follow and that will be free. Yeah, so yeah. 
And how do you deal with punctuation in subtitles? I will suggest that for that, basically you deal as written text. Yeah, that's the main principle. If you are writing text on the screen, on, on uh, writing text, you follow the same principle. We're not gonna be manipulating grammar in any, in any way different. Only on a few occasions, we do something that is different. Yeah, that you wouldn't do in written text. For instance, when there is dialogue in the same subtitle. Yeah, uh, when we use italics, although I, as, I guess that probably in Cyrillic, you don't use italics, but in Latin languages we do, but inverted commas. And those, normally the companies will tell you, they will have their guidelines like Netflix, the ones that I put earlier on. If you go to their website, they will have Ukrainian and they will tell you what, for Ukrainian, we like this, this, this and that. Uh, if you need to do this, use inverted commas. If you need this, use an exclamation. If you need that, use a hyphen or whatever it is. So in there, they will tell you, and they vary. Normally, companies working in subtitling, they will have their own uh, punctuation guidelines. Mm -hmm. yeah. So temporal considerations, uh, time considerations, how do we deal with those? So uh, one little thing. Of course, uh, you know, one basic thing is when somebody is talking, I put something on the screen. When somebody stops talking, I take the text from the screen. That means that even if you don't speak Chinese or Spanish, you will relate audio, talking, text on the screen has to be the translation. Yeah, that's what we call synchronization. It's very, you know, animal in that sense. You don't need to do anything. You know, you see something and then something appears, you are, your attention is caught. So that's what we call synchronization. So you need to synchronize your text, your translation with the audio. And then how do we do that? So we do something that is called spotting. And this is what I would like you to do for uh, tomorrow. Uh, not to do it, but to decide. So spotting, also called queuing or timing, is deciding when in a video, when am I going to go into that video? How am I going to do my subtitles? How many subtitles am I going to have on my video? And this is the first thing we do. To be able to do that, we created what is known in the industry, a time code reader. So each image in a audiovisual program, film, DV, um, documentary, animation, corporate video, each single frame picture has got a number. And the numbers are in here, they are hours, then they are minutes, seconds, which is what we work, and frames. Okay, so we usually have to take into consideration the last four seconds and frames. Okay, and what we've got here is uh, to make it a little bit more exciting for all of us, cinema and television or um, internet are different. Cinema moves at 24 frames per second, traditional cinema. So many subtitling programs will tell you if it's 24 frames or anything else. So you can be working, your video can be 24 frames if it's cinema. If you are working for television or DVDs or uh, internet, then you can be working for 25 or 29.97, 30, depending on which part of the world you are. Yet yeah, this is a, a legacy from uh, analog technology. We're not using it that much anymore because we are using now high definition television the way we produce uh, audiovisual programs, but you will still have to be careful on how many frames you've got on your video. Because of course, if you do, if your video is 25, but your subtitling program is working at 24, they're gonna be out of sync. They're, gonna, they're not gonna be working properly. So you always need to be aware on how many frames your video has got. Okay, and you need to know uh, uh, where you belong. Usually you've got here the distribution of the world. Um, yellow is most of us uh, will be uh, PAL. And that means that our videos move at 25 frames per second. Yeah, and those are the ones that I use with my students. But if you are in other parts of the world, like North America and so on, uh, the orange one, SECAM, it doesn't matter, it's the same, it's 25 frames per second. So no problem. And it's only the green ones, which are NTSC, which are USA, and they move at 29.97 or 30. Yeah. And then uh, you need to know which video you have. Otherwise, sometimes you lose the synchronicity 
or the uh, subtitling program, it will recognize the video and then it will tell you, okay, your video is whatever. Yeah, 25 or 29 or whatever. So you need to bear in mind that we've got all these times and then in here, if you're working on 29, every 29, it will be one more second. Yeah, because it's only every 25 is uh, one more second. And I'm assuming that we are working on this one, pulse cam or HDTV at 25 frames per second. Okay. And that's the division. So the final thing that I want to tell you, and I'm worried about, I want to move to show you the program uh, and, and we'll see more uh, tomorrow. Now, how long do I leave my subtitle on the screen? And you can leave your subtitle, uh, you know, what they did was this experiment many years ago, which was, okay, I can do two lines, maximum 35 characters per second. Yeah, that was the uh, traditional approach. So what they did was put the text on the screen, two lines, full two lines. One second, who's read it? Nobody. Two seconds, nobody. Three seconds, nobody finishes. Four seconds, the fast readers, they finish. Five seconds, virtually everyone but it's still people that are slow haven't managed to read it. And then they discovered that if we leave it two full lines, six seconds, everybody reads it. Even the slow readers can manage. And then from there we created, and it's still vastly used in the industry, the six second rule. We leave maximum six seconds on the screen for my subtitles, um, and then I can do two full lines. And then from there I do, um, um, I divide it. If they're speaking for three seconds, then it will be half. If it's four seconds, it's more than half. If it's two seconds, it's less than half. So if I can do the maximum as Netflix is uh, 42 characters per second, uh, 42 characters per line, then in, two, in six seconds, I will be able to do 84. Yeah, because it's the two lines. But if it's three seconds, it will have to be less. It will have to be 42 or a bit more than 42. Now, that way of presenting the information, which is uh, we used to use words per minute, now we were more characters per second. See, this one is, if we take the traditional approach, is 12 characters per second. That's very, very slow. But that is what some people do. And translating things like Big Bang Theory or House of Cards with 12 characters per second is really, really challenging because you have to delete lots of information because it's very slow. Another thing that Netflix is changing is upping the number of characters and assuming that people are reading faster because they are more used with the internet now. And they're going to up to 17 characters per second. Now, many professionals think that that is too much and they don't like working because uh, at that speed because they think many people don't read. They don't, they don't manage to read the full text. So 15, is the sort of uh, compromise, reading speed, yeah? So when I work with my students, I make them work both 15 and 17, yeah? So that they can see the difference. And 17 is easier because you have to condense less information. You can incorporate much more of the original, yeah? Uh, but again, you might want to just play with your students and expose them to different reading speeds, and then they can see what is feasible and what is not feasible. Uh, depending on uh, how much they have to incorporate in their translation. Again, if you're working with uh, other characters, uh, traditionally five characters per second is what you would write in Japanese or in Chinese. Uh, though Netflix, for instance, now is pushing uh, to nine characters, nearly double, and making it uh, faster. So you can see how uh, the industry is changing and the new commerce OTT developers are creating new guidelines that we didn't have before. And that, comes usually with fighting and clashing, people that are not very happy on how things are done and they're changing too much and so on, okay? Now, what I want to do with all these basics in, uh, in subtitling, I'm gonna show you um, how to do a few subtitles only, okay? And I'm gonna leave this one here and I'm going to come to uh, my platform here, I'm going to be working um, with one platform, um, and I wanted to show you 
in here. No, it's not going to let me until I, yeah, in here. Uh, you will have it in the PowerPoint. Um, and I'm jumping a bit because I don't, uh, I'll see that tomorrow. But in here, in this PowerPoint, uh, you've got that, um, this area, and you've got here um, the information, what I'm going to, uh, this is the website, and you could try, you can ask for a free trial if you want to, and then you can practice what I'm doing now. And I'm giving you two sets of guidelines on step-by-step, -step, what is it that you need to do? Okay, so this is the free trial. If you like it, and or if you are already a professional and you're looking for a place to do, uh, I was discussing this with the company, and you can have a discount until the end of this month. You've got there if you approach them as listen, um, I'm thinking about buying something here. They will give you a 25% discount. Yeah, if you wanted to. Um, in 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 the free one, I think it's for one week and allow you to play and see how things are done. Now, there are two little things that you need to be to bear in mind. One thing is um, when you work in here to be able to take the most of the uh, environment, you need to install a little thing which they called the Una agent. This is the icon that I've got here. Yeah, you install it and I've give you a guideline on how to install it. It's very, very simple. You install it and once you've got it installed, it disappears and only when you activate it, it will be behind the scenes. So you don't see it. So now I don't have it activated. If I activate it, you will see it does something like this is loading and it loads and goes down here. It takes a little while. Yeah, and that's it. It disappears and you can see at the bottom of my screen here, uh, that is the icon that we allowed my computer and the platform to be connected and help me do better things with my subtitles. Yeah, to use the sound wave and the shot change detection, Yeah, which I'm going to show you now. So I'm, I've done that and this is something that you I recommend you do. You install it and it's that simple. Once it's gone, that's it, you forget about it. And now this is the platform where I can go in. So I'm going to log in and you're going to see something slightly different. But basically, you've got Translate Pro, uh, Create, Review, and Burn and Encode. Okay, those are the, the four that I want to discuss with you. Today, I'm only paying attention to Create Pro. I'm going to do three subtitles. Yeah, I want to show you how easy is it to do it. They, I am now on this platform. I'm not on my computer anymore. This is all online, so it's, it's not installed on my computer. Everything is in there. So if I close now and I go to, uh, I fly to Kiev and I go to uh, Alexander's uh, office and I say, oh, listen, I need to finish. I can log from there and I log into all my material and it's all in there. Or I go to a coffee, internet cafe, I can log in there. Or I go to my laptop, I can log from there, from anywhere in the world, from any computer, everything is in there. It, it takes away the risk of incompatibilities that you don't have it installed or whatever. So I'm gonna show you now this one here and I will discuss what the other ones are good for and particularly for education tomorrow. But this one here, I've got it. And if I just click in here, it tells me create a new project. I've got old ones, ignore, you won't see anything when you start and I say, okay, create a new project and I'm gonna call it Ukraine, okay? And this is gonna be my project, okay? One of the beauties of this program is that you can manipulate, you want, you can um, customize all the short, the, um, uh, the shortcuts. So you want to, you don't want to be with your mouse, play, stop, go here, go there. You want to have short uh, shortcuts so that you can produce. Uh, you know, you don't have to get your hands away from the uh, laptop or from your keyboard. Now, what I do, and this is what we've done in the industry for, for a long time, is I'll show you my keyboard. I'm using a desktop. So my keyboard here, you can see that on this part, I've got a small keyboard, which is what we call the numeric keypad. This is my video player as if I was with video games, that's my video player. And then in here, that's my text, that's what I'm gonna be writing my text. So what I have got is that number five, I play my video. Number four, you can see that there is an arrow going back 
this, that's what I'm going to be moving, rewinding my video. Number six, I'm going to be forwarding my video. The zero, that's going to be my timing. That's when I decide the start of my subtitle. And then the dot deal that I've got in my keyboard, that's the end of my subtitle. So I only need five shortcuts so that I can, I never need to leave the keyboard. Yeah, and you can do it. You go here to the settings. Uh, you've got your hotkeys. Yeah, setting hotkeys, and then you edit them. Yeah, and I give you all this you've got in my easy guide. Yeah, I will open here very quickly. This is what I have. Um, I've already sent you is this Create Pro. Yeah, and this is a step by step what I'm telling you. You know, when you go there and then if you want to uh, configure your hotkeys, you do this settings, hotkeys, you go to edit, you change and blah, blah, blah. So all the information is here. So I'm only just showing you so that you know a little bit, but it's all very detailed in there. So you just edit and then once you edit, you apply and that's, you've got it. Yeah, so I close there. And then for this, for any particular project, then you need to tell how you want to work. So for this project, I want to say, okay, the general, I'm going to be working in English. But if you're working in Ukrainian, then you put Ukrainian. If you're going to be translated into German, then you put German. And then you will maximize the, uh, the spell checker and everything that is got to do with German. Yeah. So you just choose here which language. The font, by default, Arial. By default, uh, Una's platform follows the patterns suggested by uh, Netflix. So if you're happy with Netflix, then it will be the same. If you want to change, then you need to reconsider. So in here, it goes for Arial. Then the display, I've got 24, but I could do 30. It's got nothing to do with the final thing. It's only how I'm going to see them on my screen here, yeah, on, on the computer. It's not for anything else, but 24 is big enough, but you can do a bit bigger if you want. Then the screen here, uh, I'm going to do maximum line length how many characters per line maximum. Then I'm going to say, okay, I want to do like Netflix, or I'm going to do, no, 39. I'm not going to write more than 39. That's my maximum. If I do something wrong, alert me. Yeah. And then maximum per line, per subtitle, two lines. No more than two lines. Although if you're doing subtitles for deaf people, sometimes you can do three or you can do four. Or if you are doing bilingual subtitles in Swedish and in Finnish or in French and Flemish, then you can put four and then you write in, in French and in Flemish. So it depends on the circumstances of your country. The video here, it says this one is 30 uh, frames here. Uh, it could be less and I think mine is 25. Yeah. The reading speed, which is also important, by default 17. I think it's too high and I'm going to be working at 15 characters per second. And I click in here, please, yes, count the spaces. The blank spaces need to be counted as well. Yeah. And then I've got here information, minimum duration on the screen. Then I'm going to say, okay, the minimum should be uh, one second and the maximum duration, six seconds. Yeah, as I explained to you, that's, that should be. Yeah. And then I apply. So on those parameters, anything that I do wrong, the computer is going to alert me. Okay, so now what I've got is I'm going to, uh, this is what it looks, this area, all this area is going to be for my word processing, for my subtitles, and then here is for my video. And then at the bottom here is going to help me, it's going to make me visualize the audio, plus also short changes when the images are changing. And we'll explain tomorrow the, the, the need to take care of short changes. But this is what, what the program is doing now, is gonna do is scan the video and find all that information and make it visual for me so that it will help me be, to speed up my, my spotting. Yeah? So in here now, I'm gonna bring a video. So I've got here my media, and then I say, okay, I want a video. And then, now it says here, analyze with UNAS agent, which is the little plugin that I showed you earlier on. If you don't have it, or if you don't want to install it, do untick. But that means that you're not going to see anything here. This is going to be empty. And you're not going to see the audio, and you're not going to be helped 
by that information. So if you tick it and you've got the, um, the UNA agent, then I look for my video. Okay, it's gonna check it with UNA. And then this is my video here. And then there is my video. And you can see already in here, all this here is silence. It's flat, nobody's talking. So I can skip over that when I'm doing my subtitles. And I can see that they are talking here when the audio goes up. And then this orangey thing here means that there, there's gonna be a short change, a short change. The images are gonna change in there, only there. All this is always the same image. There is changing. Yeah. So I'm going to do, uh, actually, I don't want this video. Hold on. I'm going to use another video, which is easier to show you quickly. Uh, open it went there. So I'll disregard this video on Ukraine, but this one here, this one here. Okay. So this is my video. I'm going to play and I'm going to do a few subtitles. You can see there. Uh, the information here. So you can see because nobody's talking, it's moving and it's nothing is happening there. But as soon as he starts talking, we'll be here. And I can see that that is coming. He's going to be talking soon. I wonder what happened to the one from last year. And that is silence. So I can see this could be good for a good for a one subtitle. Yeah, because it's one full sentence. It's not too long. It's a long pause that comes afterwards. So I think that would be fine. I'll continue. Each year we spend good money on these things and come out here and the one from last year is gone. That seems to be okay as well. It's, there is a pause here, but it's a little pause. I'm not sure how long it is, but it's nine second numbers nine and second number 13 is going to be four seconds. And I said maximum is six, so it could be okay. There's going to be a short change here. So my subtitle will have to appear afterwards. I don't want to have it there. So I can see there. Well, the she appears and then she starts flowers talking. Die and the caretaker or somebody takes them away. Yeah, and that is there. So I can follow my clip, but I think here I could do three subtitles, maybe four if I want to keep the uh, silence there, but I'm gonna do three subtitles. So I know if I go there, that's when it begins. And then I'm gonna show you two ways of doing this. I can do it without listening. I can just say, okay, I can see the begins there. I can move it there. And then I say, okay, here I'll start my subtitle because I can see that is in there. If I want my subtitle in, as I told you, I use my numeric keypad and I do zero. And then once I press zero, just look, here there is nothing. Yeah, my subtitle, my subtitle number one here, there is nothing because I haven't done anything. But if I now say, okay, here, which is uh, second five, frame four, I want to start my subtitle. So if I press now the zero, then you can see that here I've got that time coincide with this time. And that's why my subtitle is going to appear. And then if I continue and I say, okay, and I'm gonna leave it until there, because that's when he stop, stops talking. I move it there. This is the end of my subtitle. And I press for the end, dealt, point, dealt. And this is the end of my subtitle. So this is what my subtitle is going to occupy. It's going to begin here. It's going to end there. So it's going to be on the screen two seconds, four frames. And then I do my translation. Now, pardon my French, because my translation is not going to make much sense. But I'm doing there, and then you can see the program is already me is already alerting me, and lots of information is giving me lots of information. On the top line, it says 40 characters. On the bottom line, 16. Remember, I said maximum 39. That's why the final one is red. Yeah, that F there is red because I I've, I've gone too much there. So that's telling me okay, no, I should go a bit. Lower than I've got now, 36 on the top, 16 at the bottom, 53. But this means that because it's only two seconds, that's too many characters per second, it's 24. And remember we said 15 should be what I should allow. In fact, the program is telling me here, if it was 13, this black, little black thing here, 
that's what it should be ideal. A, 32 characters. That's what I should, that should be my ideal translation. And I've written so far 52. So that's why it's going red. And it's telling me if it's red, red, this is really bad. But if I'm not too bad, yeah, that I'm getting closer, then you can see it goes, okay, here, uh, and it goes, I'll take, I'll delete one, and then it goes orange. So it's not red, I've done a little bit more. Uh, I'm told to do 15, but I've done 15.2. So it's gonna go orange, but it got more, it got something else. Yeah, so I can say, okay, fine, now my translation is fine. I'll put my full stop in here, and then I'll return, and it's my second subtitle. Yeah, and my second subtitle is here. I can do the same. I can say, okay, here is where it starts. So I go there, just check, and I say zero, insert, and then you can see 821, 821, coincides. And then what I say is, okay, I'm gonna do it until here. That's the end of my settle because I can see, and this is gonna be the end. I do del, del here, and it tells me, comes here 821, finishes 1310, 414, and then again, ideally it should be uh, 68 characters, written in there and more or less here. So I'm gonna write my text here, yeah, and I'm gonna do it differently. So of course, it's not going to alert me until I write a lot more because uh, I've got more time. So it's allowing me to write and now I've written 15.3. I can say, okay, fine, no, there. I am doing 14 characters, 14. So that's my translation. I'm happy or not happy or whatever. Yeah, and then once I am at the end, I return and this is my third subtitle and so on. Yeah, so I only need my five keys. Uh, if I went here and I want to do something, if I go say I wonder, there and I go with my number four, can you hear? So if I do a little bit more um, and let me see. I'll put it a bit higher in here. So if I go here and I am, uh, after he has started, if I wanted to make really sure what I am, I can do number four. This is called noise scrubbing. So I'm going back and I can still hear noise. I can hear him talking. And there is silence. So I know now that that is. So if I think, okay, now I don't hear anything, I could just say, okay, fine, here is my subtitle, here is what I want to start, and it's my start, yeah? And I can do that, and I can move my video forward, back or forward, yeah? One by one, depending on how I want. And now what I want to do is just see what I've done, yeah? And I can do that, I can show you like this or the other way, so if I play now, I wonder what happened to the one from last year. Each year we spend good money on these things. We come out here and the one from last year is gone. Well, the flowers die. Yeah. And then you continue with however many subtitles you've got to do. Now, if I now finish and close, yeah, and I, I just, I'll save it the first time, although it saves every two minutes. Okay, every two minutes is being saved on the platform. But, you know, I, I, I'm a bit panicky sometimes. I always save in and uh, control safe or whatever. But if, if I save it now and I say, okay, fine, I'm gone. And, and I leave it and I, I don't need to download anything. I don't need to do absolutely anything. I'll just go say, I'm, I just uh, log out. I come tomorrow and I come to my login area. This is my login. I'll go here. I'll go to my Create Pro. And I've got my Ukraine. And when I open it, I've got my two subtitles here and it links to the video where I left it. And then I can continue with my work from there. So everything is kept here and is done there. And as I said, you can use all this here <coughs> for the benefit of synchronizing and making it really, really accurate in the presentation. Okay, it's that simple. If you follow the two, but well, one guide that I've given you, the agent is only so that you can activate all this information, okay? The, the visual information. 
And the other guidelines is on how to set up the environment so that then you can start producing your own subtitles. Yeah, and literally takes 10 minutes. You only need to uh, do the settings, the hotkeys, five, I would recommend to do, which is play and stop your video, going back, going forward, and then indicating beginning of my subtitle, end of my subtitle. Yeah, you don't need more than that. With that, you are set to start producing your subtitles. Okay. Now I am aware of the time, which is three minutes past the hour. So what I would like you to, what I would like to uh, uh, um, um, suggest to you is uh, on the PowerPoint, you've got here the homework, which is I'm asking you to watch. This is a very small scene called Encounter. That's my title uh, from the film is a wonderful life. It's very short. It lasts two minutes, I think, or a minute and a bit. So it's very, very short. And you can find it on this YouTube link. And what I want you, what I want you to do. Yeah, maybe you could share the link in the chat. It okay. would be much more convenient. Uh, okay, I'll do that. Uh, but anyway, this is the the link. So you watch it, copy, and then what I want you to do is decide, you just listen to it and decide how many subtitles will you put on that video? How many times will you send text on the screen? It doesn't matter whether it is one line or two lines. Yeah, but I want to know how many, Netflix call them events, how many texts or how many times will you be interfering with the images, okay? And then uh, on the chat here, okay, I'll, when I've got this, okay, with everyone, and I think I've shared it now. So everybody now has got the link. So just listen to this and then tomorrow, um, I will be, I'll finalize a little bit more on the subtitling, although the things you can find from guidelines and so on. And I will tell you, we will discuss um, how to, uh, what sort of activities uh, to produce, um, what sort of lengths of the videos, if you need to do the assessment, what sort of assessment, um, I will tell you what I do and what other people do and, and how you can uh, arrange that. I will show you as well some tests that some companies uh, have to um, to give jobs to newcomers so that you can, you know, if they are testing them in the industry on these strategies, maybe it will be a good idea for you as well to produce or to create some exercises along those lines so that when they do a professional test, they already, uh, they've experienced a little bit what is in there. And I promise as well that tomorrow we'll have time for questions. Um, that's why we will be sending um, another link uh, for the um, for the uh, seminar. So it will be slightly different uh, so that you can participate and then I can see you as well and you can be asking me questions throughout. So it'll be a bit more dynamic in that sense. Muchas gracias, Jorge. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I forgot to say that. Duche de acuyu. I learned to say that one, but de nada. Yeah, but, but it's, it's rather for you. It was very interesting. And um, thank you a lot for these uh, nice examples and for this practical part where you have shown everything. And I'm looking forward for today, tomorrow's class, this, this continuation. Me too. Yeah, me too. I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, and yes, um, all the material will be available and I will really strong candidates to take advantage of the technology out there so that they can practice and, and produce their own subtitles. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So we want to thank, first of all, uh, Jorge to you, then the audience for being so patient and uh, attentive. And of course, uh, one more time, remind that tomorrow we'll have another event, mostly for those who want to develop a course of audiovisual translation. So uh, we'll send you the link for the event tomorrow, tomorrow morning. And see you tomorrow.